What's going on, family? Scrapbook Boxing Museum of the Forgotten Fisticuffs series. I want to stay on the flyweight division with Black Bill. And why I feel he was jobbed, because he was jobbed. You see, you have to understand the time in which these men came. Now, Kid Chocolate was on the horizon. He was on the undercard of this fight. And everyone knew immediately he was going to become a champion in the featherweight division. It was a matter of time. Because Kid Chocolate, as quiet as this kept, Kid Gavilon and Ray Robinson, Joe Lewis, Charlie Burley, they all patterned themselves. Johnny Bratton, off of Kid Chocolate. They'll tell you if you ask them. Who did you patty yourself after? And they'll tell you, Kid Chocolate. Henry Armstrong, all of them. Because of his style. Because of his aggressiveness as a boxer. The beautiful jab and perpetual motion he had. He was phenomenal. But Black Bill was also from Cuba. And Kid Chocolate patted himself after Black Bill. As quiet as it's kept, Black Bill was worshipped in Cuba. He was a star during those years. And the flyweight division was not prepared for a fighter like Black Bill. See, that division was established in 1910. It was 108 pounds. That's the weight they decided to make the flyweight division. December 18th, 1916, Jimmy Wilde would knock out Zulu Kid in London in 11 rounds. So Jimmy Wilde would be the first official flyweight champion in boxing history. On February 11th, 1921, Johnny Buff would outpoint Frankie Mason, New Orleans in 15 rounds, but that was for the America's Flyweight Championship belt. Wasn't worldwide recognition. And we went over all this in previous videos. But I want to break down why Black Bill was cheated out of an opportunity to become a flyweight champion. And all those who study understands this. Otherwise, they'll just want to have an argument. But they understand this. March 1st, 1923. Frankie De Niro outpoints Pancho Villa. At the Madison Square Garden, New York, in 15 rounds. Now, although Pancho Villa had lost to Frankie De Niro, though, he still got an opportunity for the World Flyweight Championship belt. And that was against Jimmy Wilde. June 18th, 1923. He knocked out Wilde in seven rounds. And he was now recognized as World Flyweight Champion, was Pancho Villa. But Frankie Gennaro had fought for the crown when Pancho Villa died. July 25th, 1925. But it was said, hold on one second. Because you have a young man by the name of Fidel LaBarber. He had represented the Olympic Games. Quite as his kept, he was some fighter with Fidel LaBarber. And he would defeat Petey Cerrone, who would eventually become the featherweight champion in the world. And Petey Cerrone would lose his crown in 1937 to none other than Melly Jackson. Henry Armstrong, New York's Madison Square Garden. And Armstrong, like I said, who patted himself after Kid Chocolate because it was Henry Armstrong who was working on a railroad when newspaper hit Henry Armstrong on the leg. And it was Kid Chocolate. He earned $75,000. So all those fighters, Kid Chocolate and Black Bill, Emmanuel Jackson, all of those guys came from Cuba. They all had the same look and the same style. And it was admired. They loved the dress, they had the slick hair. 
but man, it could box. Fidel Barber would have to wind up facing Frankie Gennaro. Barber was recognized as the world flyweight champion, but temporarily retired from the ring, 1927. The corporal Izzy Swartz at our point at Newsboy Brown in New York City, December 16th, 1927. We're going to take a look at this. Swartz was recognized as a flyweight champion in New York. And they had to establish a true champion. So February 6th, 1928, Gennaro began the NBA recognition of outpointing Frankie Blanninger. 10 rounds in Toronto, Canada. March 2nd, 1929, Emile Spider Plander had knocked out Gennaro one round in Paris, France. And about that was advertised as the world title. Now, this is where the problem starts to occur. It starts happening in 1929. Izzy Swartz was recognized by the New York Commission Gennaro was recognized by the NBA. So when the NBA was established in 1920, and the New York SAC was established in 21, they always had conflict as to who was the champion. And this is where you had the problem with Black Bill. Why? Because April 18th, 1929, Frankie Gennaro had won from Plata on a file in five rounds. Paris, France. You notice they had to go overseas in order to make a lot of these fights happen. And March 21st, 1930, the fight we're talking about now, Midget Wargas, an outpointed Black Bill, New York City, 15 rounds. Now, how did this possibly happen? And I'm going to show you something right now for one moment. Now, I want us to take a look. At the flyweight ranking, 1928. Now here you see 571 points for Izzy Swartz. And 440 points for Newsboy Brown. Like I told you, these two would meet each other December 16th, 1927. And Izzy Swartz would capture the crown. And I also told you Frankie Gennaro who had 419 points. And Frenchie Blanninger had 290 points, would meet each other as well. Frankie Gennaro would defeat him. No problem there. As you can see, number six, because Johnny Hill was in a, he was in a mix too. He's part of that tournament. Emil Plander and Midget Wargas would face each other. You don't see Black Bell in his ranking system. I'm going to show you why in a moment. Now, this is how they ranked in 1927. 610 points was the highest points you can possibly make. All right? 498 points went to Newsboy Brown. And 480 points went to Frankie Gennaro. You had Easy Swartz and Willie Davis, Johnny McCoy and Major Wargas. Frankie Ballinger had 109 points. Where is Black Bill? Now you have him here in 1929's ranking system for 1930. 533 points with the Frankie Gennaro. 491 points with the Black Bill. Now this is the ranking system. This is how they rank fighters back then. Now Black Bill was supposed to get an opportunity with Frankie Gennaro. Now, what happened, the reason why he didn't fight Frankie Gennaro was because Frankie Gennaro was 19 years old. The New York SAC didn't recognize anyone that was 19. They couldn't ca- go past six rounds. So Frankie Gennaro was technically a six-round fighter under the rules of the New York SAC. And this is why it's important to study your history because whatever happens today happened in the past. Whatever happened in the past is happening today in terms of the way things are manipulated. And Black Bill never got his shot. He wound up fighting Midget Wargas. Look where Midget Wargas, he's number eight. 
He only has 223 points. To Black Bill, 491 points. Now, Black Bill had no problem with Speedy Dado, Emil Plander, Eugene Hurst, Frankie Blanager. They put him up against Midget Wargas. And they gave the deciding victory to Midget Wargas. So they scapegoated Black Bill. And I just wanted to show you the way things were manipulated for black fighters at that time. Friday, March 28, 1930. Young Jack Thompson. His name was Cecil Lewis Thompson. He was born August 17, 1904, Los Angeles, California. He died April 11, 1946. He was 41 years of age at the time of his death. He would reside in Los Angeles, California. So five foot eight inches, he was a welterweight, fought from 1922 to 1932. He had a total career of 122 fights, 79 wins, 31 losses, and 49 knockouts. Now, he was stopped himself on three separate occasions. He'd be in the ring with Jimmy McLaurin. With 16,798 spectators in the audience in New York Madison Square Garden. And they came to see both these two men because young Jack Thompson was another fighter, like I told you, with Kid Chocolate. Tall, he bounced around, had a beautiful jab, and he knew how to fight. He just came once again around at a time but things just didn't go his way. And the referee was Jim Crawley. The judge was Harold Barnes. And George Lacrone was another judge. And Jim McLaurin was 22 years old. He was five foot six inches. He was a welterweight and had a 67 inch reach. Had 45 wins, six losses, and three draws. He had 17 knockouts, and he was in there with the who's who of boxers. And young Jack Thompson was 25 years old. He stood five foot eight inches. He was a welterweight and had a 65 inch reach. He had a record of 23. 12, 39 knockouts with 65 wins. And McLaurin hit Thompson low more than five occasions. He even broke his hand in the process. And this would allow young Jack Thompson an opportunity to face Jackie Fields for the welterweight championship belt, May 9th, 1930. As you can see here, young Jack Thompson is to your right and Jackie Fields is to your left. And he would defeat Jackie Fields 15 rounds in Detroit. He was at the Olympic Stadium. 15 rounds. It'd be for the World Welterweight Championship belt. The NBA version of that. Referee Elmer Slim. His name is McLean. He had young Jack Thompson up 10 to 3. Jack Thompson was 25 years old. To 5 foot 8, he was a welterweight. Fought from 1922 to 1932. Had 65 wins, 12 draws, 39 knockouts, 24 losses. Jackie Field was 22 years old. Stood 5 foot 7 and a half inches. He was a welterweight and had a 69 inch reach. Fought from 1922 to 1933. Walked into the ring with a record of 56 wins. Four losses, one draw, 22 knockouts. Now, Jackie Fields, his name was Jacob Finkelstein. He was born February 9th, 1908, in Chicago, Illinois. He died June 3rd, 1987, Los Angeles, California. He fought from 1925 to 1933. Had a record, a total record coming in at 84 fights. 72 wins, nine losses, 31 knockouts, and he was stopped one time. He was in a ring with fighters such as Lou Bullard, King Tut, Young Terry, Sam Bruce, Sergeant Sammy Baker, Pete Myers, Young Corbett III, Baby Joe Gans, William Gorilla Jones, Vince Dundee, Young Corbett III, just to name a few. As a matter of fact, he went back and forth with Young Jack Thompson twice. And Young Corbett III would defeat Jackie Fields. And Jimmy McLaurin would defeat Young Corbett III. 
And then Barney Ross would defeat Jim McLaurin. And we'll get into that. And then, of course, Henry Armstrong would defeat Barney Ross. Then Fitzy Civic, and on and on and on. But young Jack Thompson was a very, very good fighter. I wanted to expose him as well as Jackie Fields, who I met several times. He would live in Las Vegas, Nevada, but he would reside in Los Angeles, California. He was born in Chicago. And he told me the Chicago fighters that he sparred with were fighters such as Barney Ross. You had Ray Miller, who was a dynamic puncher. Ever Hammer, another very good puncher. And he told me Johnny Bratton, years later, was a hell of a fighter as well. Wound up becoming a welterweight champion. He would defeat Charlie Fuseli for that title. It was a vacant crown that was left over by Ray Robinson when he moved up in weight to challenge for the middleweight division. At that time, Marcel Sedan was the champion. So that's it for this video. I wanted to get into the 1930s. Next video, I'm going to go back down to 1929. There's a couple of fighters that I want to include in this series. So look up for that video. The Harlem Thunderbolt. His name was Harry Smith, Jack McVeigh, and others. But thanks for hanging in there with me to scrap a box and museum of the Forgotten Fisticuff series. All great fights and all great fighters will never be forgotten on my channel. We're going to continue 100 years of world championship fights. We're going all the way up to 2000, the Mayweather era. So hang in, on, hang in there with me with this long journey. Salute.